Hello and welcome to this recording of Cadre's Better Together Countywide Virtual Wildfire Tabletop Exercise. I'm Marcia Hovey, the Executive Director of Cadre, and I want to welcome you today. If you're watching this presentation for the sec second time, as in you were watching it live, this first part may look a little different to you. We had a technical glitch, and so the first few slides had to be re-recorded, but the rest of it is the same, so enjoy. Type your name and organization in the chat and then rename yourself to your first name and your organization so that we can get to know you better. For accessibility purposes, we're running two artificial intelligence voice transcription services. One is Otter AI, it's in the upper right, upper left of your screen, and then Zoom transcription it should show up in the bottom. If you need assistance with Zoom or Otter, you can chat with Anna, look for access hyphen Anna, and she'll be able to help you. The tools we'll be using today, your computer, which will be using the chat feature, and you will be going to a second website. You'll use your smartphone to scan a QR code. We will be using breakout rooms within Zoom, and you'll need some note paper to, to keep track of some of the things that we'll be doing. We do realize that folks that are using screen readers will have a challenge with both chat and the live transcription running at the same time. We don't have a great solution yet for that, but we can download the chat for you so that you can review it later and not miss anything. If you'd like that option, please let us know in the chat. We're also using a new tool today. It's called Jamboard. The link will be in the chat. You have to open a second browser on your computer, put in the new link, and then you'll be able to toggle back and forth between the two. You can see uh, on the screenshot on the slide that there's a red arrow pointing to the sticky note. That's where you will click. That will then give you an option to pick a color of your sticky note. Then you can type anything you want on it and then hit save and you can edit it after the fact too. At the top of the screen you see it says don't click clear frame. If you click clear frame it will erase everything so please don't do that. And if you need assistance using the Jamboard you can contact Cindy Stewart at assist hyphen Cindy. So here's the exercise overview. You should have received an attachment with your Zoom login this morning. That would, will go into the details about some of the resources we are referencing today. That resource document is also on the Cadre website along with this recording. So you should be able to access it there. The exercise objectives are to clarify roles and responsibilities of government and all organizations in the community. Explore planning gaps and how organizations can work together to fill them. Inform participants about existing resources and processes. The assumptions of the exercise. Number one is that this exercise is an open, low stress, no fault environment. We welcome different viewpoints. The exercise scenario is based on existing processes. Disasters are overwhelming for everyone involved. We're all in this together. We do not have all the answers yet. We are all here to learn. And our agenda for, here, for today, for day one, we're going to be covering information gathering at the beginning of, a, of an emergency public information and alert and warning. And then on day two, which is next week on September 8th, we will be covering temporary evacuation points, shelters and local assistance centers. And then we added a day three, so you get a bonus session. We'll add it in October. The date is yet to be determined and we'll be covering volunteers and donations, debris removal and long-term recovery. There was just too much to cover in two sessions and we didn't want to to discount any of these any of these topics because they're all important to a wildfire. 
the format of the exercise will present a scenario and then there will be one or more questions for you to respond to and we'll let you know if you're going to be responding via chat or in a break room or taking a poll or actually getting to talk live. This exercise will take you through the response and recovery activities of a wildland urban interface fire in your city or a nearby city. There will also be exercise follow-up Zoom sessions for any organization who has more questions about planning. You can type in the chat if you're interested in that or fill out the survey at the end of the Zoom call. The scenario is not set in a specific location in the county. It's designed so that every jurisdiction can imagine that the fire is occurring in their own city or your city or organization is being asked to take on certain responsibilities, certain activities of the impacted jurisdiction because they're overwhelmed and they need help. The reality is that any major disaster occurring in the smaller cities in Santa Clara County will need to coordinate response with other jurisdictions. And although the scenario is wildfire, these planning concepts may be applied to most emergency situations. If you want to imagine that you're having a flood or a hazmat spill or something else, the same processes will apply. So if you're surrounded by other cities and you don't have a wildland urban interface, it doesn't matter. You can still play along with this exercise. Okay, let's get started. A grass fire started in or near your city on Friday at 9 a.m. It's putting up a lot of smoke and you hear lots of sirens headed to the area. As standard procedure, the either the uh, CEO or city manager of your city has received a call from the local fire department providing initial response information and indicating the potential for evacuations. The CEO city manager notifies department heads who have an emergency response role. Local law enforcement also calls to advise that they have they are at the fire command post. Okay, so information gathering. This is the first part of any disaster. The communication in every disaster is noted as one of the big challenges. So we're going to spend a good portion of today discussing how to minimize the confusion for the public and ourselves. So this first, first session is going to be everyone in the chat. So the, the CEO or the city manager of the jurisdiction where this fire started is right now the only person who has direct, direct contact with the scene. So for all of you, if you aren't the city receiving the phone call, where will you look to get information of, <clears throat> sorry, about the nearby fire so that you can gather, you can decide if it's something that you need to be paying attention to or not. So we put a few of the common ones on the screen. I'm particularly interested if you use any other websites or any places that are your go-to for, for gathering information if you see a, a lot of smoke around. And let's see what we have. We have city alert systems, CAL FIRE website. Some folks are using Nextdoor, um, Pulse Point, CAL FIRE online. Okay, Lots of Pulse CAL FIRE. Point. Yeah, Pulse Point's a good one. Um, that's an app to put on your phone. And you can pick the fire departments that you want to pay attention to, and it will tell you who's responding and give you some information. Good. Twitter, CERT-based ham radio. So that would, okay, CERT ham radio, that would imply that there's a procedure that everyone logs onto their radios when they see smoke, because that's, as, that's all we know right now is we see smoke. Hmm. Okay. Alert okay. SCC. Yep. And what, and I don't know, does alert SCC send out a message every time there's smoke? I don't think so. 
and Zone Haven. We'll talk about that mm -hmm. later. Thanks, Denise. Um, a San Jose State SAMI app. Okay. All right. So I'm going to continue while uh, while you can keep typing. Yeah. Cal Fire. Okay. Cal Fire too. So this is Thank you, Jim. Uh, this is a. a a resource for you and um, the document that we sent out this morning has the link to it but just so that you know um, cadre's website has a document that has all of the twitter facebook and websites for all of the first responder organizations in the county and all of the government agencies in the county if you go to that website and you um, go cadre sv.org preparedness and then scroll down you can see the screenshot that shows mm -hmm. you where to scroll down to communications and you can grab those so if you're not sure you can always go there to get that get that resource for you and it is important sometimes they're not they don't all have the same information maybe what somebody's public information officer is on vacation so they're a little mm -hmm. slower so you can find the one that seems to be right on top of it and at least one of them will be and you can share it from there Okay, I want to ask anyone that has a public information function right now to unmute and we kind of already started to talk about this. So at this point in the fire, it's just smoke with the potential for evacuations, but you don't know that. Um, mm -hmm. But the PIO for the jurisdictions does. So would you send information out to the public or to key stakeholders at this point? In the conversation, would you notify certs heads up or, or schools or churches or horsemen's associations or a disability coordinator? Um, so if you have a public information function, if you just want to um, raise your hand and we'll try to grab some of you. Uh. We have Jan at Gavilan College with her hand raised. Welcome, Jan. So uh, at this point, I would probably just communicate with the Gavilan uh, EOC that, you know, there is smoke in the area, there is fire in the area, and, and just put out a thing, you know, should we meet? And uh, which would then be the trigger to set up a meeting in a little bit and everybody go out and get more information and bring it back. Great. How about Arn? Good. Based on your slides, it sounds like there's already a unified command in the field between PD and fire. And so if they have any information, even if it's just geographic, you know, where they are responding to and why, we would issue some type of a placeholder just to start to get a message out there. Even if it's very high level, just giving, you know, the geographic location, the type of event, and just for the community to be aware that this is happening. For yeah. the recording, can you just say your name, please? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Arn? <laughs> sorry. My bad. I'm going to keep doing that. Molly, just slap me. Uh, this is Marsha. Let's see. Who else? Uh, Liz? Yeah, <clears throat> I do personally will not be doing PIO work, but Red Cross always has an on-duty PIO and responds to the, the city. The city responds to us immediately. And we would send it out to all of our um, people and, and, and information places. Okay. So that means that the city needs to reach out to you. Yes. Yeah. And because this is just a potential for activation, this is kind of a kind of a squishy area because, or, you know, for evacuation, it's kind of squishy. We don't know exactly for sure if we're, you know, getting too excited or if we're just giving people a heads up to stand by. But we have enough volunteers who would see the smoke and report it in and start the chain within Red Cross. Okay. Sure. sure. Jennifer. Good morning, everybody. Jennifer Ponce, uh, Morgan Hills Office of Emergency Services. So from a city a PIO standpoint, one of the best practices that we came across during last year's fire is to early on establish what's called a call center. So uh, it's a... A designated phone number so that folks uh, in the community could call that number for information instead of um, calling 911. So we've implemented that as a as a new best practice. That's awesome. All right, the second part of this question is what languages 
if you're if you're putting something out is it in english on a website do you have translation available at this point those of you that already talked you're unmuted you can talk again or not. well for morgan hill it would be um in english and spanish right out of, right out of the get-go okay awesome and for Los Gatos, we currently don't have translation services, but we're working on that. I mean, we have on-call services if we had to hire somebody, you know, on the spot, but we're working on having all of our communications uh, transcribed. Okay. And then this is Kia from the County of Santa Clara OEMPIO. We use, um, we sent all of our uh, fire documents over to our language access team and they were translated to Spanish um chinese vietnamese um so yeah they're available on our website how long would that take kia for let's say like a three sentence message oh for a turnaround yeah oh very quickly like within the next hour uh especially with the fire but with the website it took you know like maybe just a, a few hours a few hours so we at that time we already had the eoc activated it was easier to do yeah, if the EOC is activated, it's much easier to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, and so for for the other organizations here in your in the chat at this point in the fire, would you send information to a distribution list that you have? And then the second part of that question is when you would send information, what whatever time it ends up being, maybe you're waiting for a you know a more definitive. Uh, call for an evacuation of some kind. How many people are on your distribution list? Uh, and so how many clients do you have or how many in your congregation or how many volunteers? Because I know that the, um, the organizations on this call know very intimately who their clients are and who their congregations are and who their volunteers are and they know their needs so this information could become very valuable to local government during the disaster to try to meet needs of a specific community marcia greg from unilu saying um greg do you want to unmute for a moment sure i was just saying that if if I had information from one of these sources that I knew was correct, so not not you know something from Facebook or something, but uh, uh, something from a, an agency, um, I might post to next door and say, uh, maybe you're noticing the smoke in the area. Here's what I heard from the Red Cross or from uh, the Palo Alto Fire Department or the university or that kind of thing. That's that's great, Greg, and to cite the source is really good because what we don't want on next door is people saying, well, I heard from my neighbor that they're evacuating. And then it gets really right. crazy. Right. A couple of hands raised. Who are they? We have Sherry and Mayor Marmarin. Sorry, did I get that right? Yeah, Marmarin, go ahead. So um, we actually have um, a West uh, uh, chat group where there's someone assigned to monitor all of these activities. And then every time she sees something, she lets the leads of the certain um, zones or cities know, okay, so this is what I'm seeing and she provides the source. So when we are informed of this, and you know, we look into it, we have cluster managers of certain zip codes. So we inform them to be on alert, to keep monitoring the situation. So if, if it gets bad where uh, you know, the city is like, okay, we're evacuating this area or don't go to this area, we reach out to individuals who are either working there in our community or living there and then we, go forward with whatever information is provided. Great, thank you. And Marmarin for the recording, and can you tell us the name of the organization you represent? 
Um, I represent uh, the Ismaili Jamaat Khana in Milpitas. Thank you. And Sherry, did you have something to share? Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, Sherry Burns, Executive Director at Silicon Valley Independent Living Center and on the Cadre Board. Um, so at this point with uh, the information that we have, we would um, uh, forward uh, official information that was already posted on social media sites or if we were able to uh, verify whatever information from reputable sources um, with the city's fire department, that kind of thing, we would share that on our social media, both Twitter and Facebook. Um, once we had uh, more details about um, the extent of the fire and we were actually able to pinpoint exactly where it was, we would double check with our uh, folks that are on our um, public safety power shutoff PSPS list. We have about 450 uh, residents in Santa Clara County that um, qualify for some assistance through PSPS events. And we would then send out an email uh, to all of those folks and that could be done fairly quickly because we already have a, a group distribution for that. Um, but then we would not uh, notify all of our clientele uh, until we had you know, more information. Um, uh, and, and, and if we knew that folks on the PSPS list were very close to the area, uh, then the, they would also receive a phone call. How many clientele, Sherry? This is Marcia. Uh, we serve um, about 1,300 uh, consumers directly where we have uh, direct contact information on. And like I said, we also, uh, of those, we have about 435 on our PSPS list. Okay. All right. So um, those of you that haven't yet put in the chat, how many people are on your distribution list? Because I think it's, it's really important to realize how deep into the community we can get. It's not just sending out an alert. Um, all right, next. So on the screen are a couple of screenshots of all of the languages that are spoken at home in residences in Santa Clara County. We typically translate the first four, which is about 677,000 people of the 1.9 million we have in Santa Clara County. If we translated all the languages on the left side of the screen, we would cover 97% of the population. And that leaves only 3% to figure out what the message is, but that's 63,000 people. So this is uh, just a kind of an awareness that we need to find ways, ways, and it's not gonna be easy to get translations deeper into our community because when people are scared, they don't like to try to translate from their native language to English. And I'm gonna show you just a really quick piece of a video that um, because we rely on Google Translate a lot. And this lady on YouTube um, shows us why not, why we shouldn't. I guess I have to stop new share. And while Marcia is dealing with the technical change, um, we had a comment in the chat box from Steve that a language spoken at home doesn't mean it's the only language they speak. Good point. That's a very good point. All right, my computer is slowly trying to... Sorry. You can only rehearse so many times with it working. Can you see the dark screen right now? Yeah, yeah it's, it's coming up. Buffering. I apologize for what's about to happen, but Hamilton. <clears throat> okay. Back it up. Lynn Manuel Marin. I apologize for what's about to happen, but Hamilton is bound to go on an international tour pretty soon. So I'm here to encourage you to have someone professionally caption your show, because if you don't, it might sound a little something like this. What makes a bastard orphanage punk? This is Carrie Curry and his game. Results will be published in Providence, Indonesia. Who is the Prime Minister and the University? Father, 
Father, Father, ten yen, you have a lot of jobs and need to put forth effort. Alcoholics are very wise. Personal planning after eight years. He made a great call. He yeah, it's a bit sad. Um, so Google Translate, if you use Google Translate, you still need someone that knows the language well enough to say if it's meeting your intent. And so if you have, if you have a person that's going to do that anyway, maybe we better just get them under contract. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to turn it over now to Anna. We're going to do a menti poll. So you should have your smartphones ready. Or you can click the link in the chat box. And what we want to do is ask you, um, it's going to ask you just one question. Um, what language capabilities do we have here um, on today's call? And I'm going to switch screens and let you guys see what you're building. Give me one second and I'll hit presentation mode and you'll see the word cloud pop up. There you go. So as Marcia said, English, Spanish, um, but let's see what some of the other ones are. French, Cantonese, Vietnamese, American Sign Language, Hebrew, Hmong. Look at all these skills we have. So this is something Cadre has a real interest in, is trying to identify organizations that could rapidly do emergency translation and um, see how many languages we can hit. It, it's gonna require a plan, but look at, and, and these are big languages. Russian, I, I was surprised on the chart because there were 17,000 or more, um, but yeah, we, we have a lot more capability that we can tap into. Any, any others? That's awesome. Look at that. 150 via the language line, 211. So yeah, so 211 is a, is a good resource. And verbal, I think, might be easier to translate than written. So maybe, maybe we get into the habit of doing little video recordings and posting them. Maybe that's quicker. I don't know. Anybody have any comments? Uh, Steve has a comment in the chat. Steve, do you? Or I can read it if you can't get off mute. It says that we're asking the wrong question about the language. We need to give people the list that we showed and have them check the highest, check the one highest up on the list that they speak. Well, my goal is to get them all, Steve. So right now we're just looking at what languages exist here and then we'll we'll go from there. But you're right. We want to try to get as deep down that first side, which is 21 languages as possible. All right. Thanks, Anna. Sure. I need to reshare somewhere. And while Marsh is doing that, there have been a couple questions. We will share the PowerPoint and these mentees uh, after the session. Okay, next section is about public information, which we've already started to touch on. I know you guys are just so sharp. Uh, now we're gonna transition the, um, this public information is the intentional distribution of information to educate the public before a disaster so that they know what to do. I'm gonna share a portion of a video from Amanda Ripley. She is an investigative reporter for Time Magazine and wrote a book, my favorite book called The Unthinkable mm -hmm. Who Survives When Disasters Strike and Why where she interviewed people who survived major fires, plane crashes, building collapses and tsunamis, and found some pretty great insights into human behavior under stress. 
In this clip, she is discussing an interview with a man named Christian, who was in Thailand, Thailand during the tsunami in 2004. He saw the ocean receding, but chose to ignore the warning. Even when he felt the water hit the side of the hotel, he assumed someone had dropped the heavy suitcase because that's what we do. We try to make it something normal. And so this video is part of a series that FEMA puts out called FEMA Prep Talks. They're modeled after TED Talks, but they're all about disasters and they're all great. So, and I wanna thank FEMA especially for giving us the video so I could pull this clip out of it. We'll put the link in the chat too. So in his case, he, uh, the water quickly receded and you can see this is a picture he took just moments after the tsunami. And destruction was unimaginable. Half the population, there were 5,000 people on that island, half of them were dying. And his mind slowly, slowly began to absorb what was happening. And he grabbed a backpack that had some, a first aid kit and started trying to find survivors and administer first aid. And, um, it was a very difficult, as you can imagine, traumatic experience for everyone involved. Um, he went back to Singapore, back to his life, and couldn't, couldn't do that, couldn't reconcile it. So he started a charity and, that built boats for fishermen who had been displaced by the tsunami. Um, and he lives to this day with a lot of guilt because he had this moment where he went to the window and he thought, maybe there's going to be a tsunami and he didn't act on it. And that's why he wants to tell this story. Now, what I tell Christian is, you know, wouldn't it have been nice if you'd gotten a message, a warning message, or someone had given you this information? It's not just on you, you know, but it feels like it's just on you. And what he wants you to know is, if you're in charge of emergency management, you need to deputize that information. You need to make sure everybody in your office building knows what the warning signs are and that they've gone down the stairs and they've trained for it physically. If you don't do that, he said, you will not want to live with yourself afterward. You need to trust people with as much knowledge as you can give them and as much physical muscle memory of getting out of a place as they will allow you to introduce them to. Because you don't want to have to think in a disaster. It will not go well. It is not how our brains are designed to deal with new, unrecognizable patterns under stress is almost impossible to behave quickly. So for Amanda, one of the things that she said is, wouldn't it be nice if you'd been given a warning? And I think I applaud some of, some of the folks on the call who said that even if there was smoke, you would start to give notice. And I think that's really impar important to be able to uh, let people have as much time as possible to process what might happen. Um, we're going to talk a little bit in, wait a minute, this is the breakout room, yeah. So we're gonna um, put you in two breakout rooms and you're gonna get to pick, there, one of them says colleges, schools, and government. Non nonprofits will be in the other. If you're not in the government or a nonprofit, you can choose to go into either one or you can stay here in the, in the main room with me and ask random questions, because we can do that too. Um, if you, there will be the Jamboard, we probably should post the Jamboard link again for people that came in late. You want to um, open a second window on your computer and put that Jamboard link in, and then you can go to the, the question, the Jamboard on public information. And go ahead, Anna, let's launch it. Sure. So the way this works, Let me pardon ask. the dog, Here's pardon the, oops, sorry, someone had a question? No, I forgot. No. So I forgot to go to the next. So, okay. So, so let me tell you how the breakouts work. Is that what you're? Well, I was going to um, give them the questions real quick and then. Sure. Okay. Um, so basic preparedness information, everybody should know, but it's probably not globally known how to sign up for an emergency alert, where to look for additional information, the definitions and types of alerts and what actions to take for each type, what to do to plan for the emergency and what to expect when the emergency comes. And there's more than that, obviously, but let's just start there. And uh, 
and know that our, our preparedness information to the public needs to be more personal than just putting up links from FEMA. Um, it's, it's not enough. Santa, it needs to, Santa Clara County residents need to know what specifically is going to happen in their city or in their building. And so the questions are the same for both of you. Right. So uh, people are starting to move, Marcia. Okay. So, so the way this works is um, you're at the bottom of your control panel on Zoom, you should see a button that says breakout room. Um, you're given two options and you hover over the number. I'm sorry about the dog in the background. You hover over the number and it'll give you the option yes or no to join that room. Um, I will be taking the group into nonprofits and community and Cindy will be taking the government colleges and schools room and Marcia will stay in this room if you have any trouble. Okay, so off we go. She just said, let me know. Yep, we're here. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're Okay, awesome. Yeah. So let's um, let's start with Anna's group and what what did you learn and what do we need to talk about in the future? We had a lot of um, really great uh, feedback, a lot of entries on the Jamboard. Um, folks were sharing some of the uh, ways in which they are preparing their own organizations and what systems they're using to uh, reach out. Uh, the, uh, and so we were only able to call on about a half dozen of us to um, speak aloud, but um, we had quite a few folks on the Jamboard. So if you didn't get a chance to share your info, please put it in the chat um, if the Jamboards are difficult for you or, um, uh, you know, we, we've captured quite a bit on our slide. So thank you. Anything that you want to let the government know or is it more jurisdictions or organization specific? I think they were, we were only able to get to, you know, kind of what some of the organizations were doing internally with their own clients and constituents and consumers. Um, but, you know, there's a lot, I guess my message to our government partners is there's a, a, a lot of activity happening in the nonprofit sector and to the greatest extent that we can share some of that via today's program, um, I think you hopefully will be impressed. And um, now we need to just strengthen those ties um, between our local jurisdictions and our nonprofits so that they get good information that they can help promote. Great, thanks. And Cindy, how about you? So the local government group uh, did a great job and, and provided some good information. Um, in general, you know, one of the things that that I heard was um, registering for Alert SEC is is so critical because the cities and the county the county is not using Alert SEC to do direct uh, notifications out, but uh, certainly the, the cities are using that or whatever other uh, notification systems that they're using. But some of many of them are um, group are. Uh, um, models that need that people need to register for so you know i just bringing that piece up um people talked a lot about uh you know we had a couple of universities that were involved or schools that were involved community college uh, uh jan from gavelin talked about a system that they use called rave alert um, it's an opt out system so they register everyone that goes to school at gavelin um, into that system so that so uh, you know local government can maybe get information out quickly by using those systems. Um, Kia shared that uh, from the county shared that um, that the county really depends on um, CBOs and NBOs, especially when it comes to uh, reaching out to uh, uh, the community with access and functional needs. Those uh, providers are going to be able to reach a deeper level of uh, access to folks that need that information in the ways that they that they can get it um, easily. So there's a the government has a very heavy dependence on uh, the CBOs and MBOs for that purpose. 
And um, hi, this is Kia again. Um, and I just wanna make it very clear to the group here that it's not that the county is not using Alert SEC to send out messages or notifications. Oh no, I'm sorry. We're, yeah, yeah, we're not sending out our general emergency preparedness messages via Alert SEC. Alert SEC is reserved only for emergencies. We <laughs> don't want it to get to the point where our community members are going to just start ignoring our messages via Alert SEC. So I just wanna make that very clear that we do use Alert SEC to send emergency alerts and notifications notification, just not general preparedness messaging. Sorry if I confused yeah. that. Yeah, no problem. Okay, thanks. Hey, one more thing, um, Kia and everyone else. I, I know that this is Jennifer from the city of Morgan Hill. I know that the county and also our city are doing a campaign called Do One Thing, and it's uh, about emergency preparedness, and there's information that goes out monthly. Um, anybody uh, that's attending today is is welcome certainly to beg, borrow, and steal what we've put together. You can go to this uh, YouTube and type in City of Morgan Hill, do one thing. Uh, so that's an additional campaign that I know the county is doing as well. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Well, guess what? It's time for a break. You're going to get five minutes. And um, yeah, you're gonna get five minutes. So come back and come back right on time because then we're gonna play a game called Name That Fire Tune. All right, so how fun. All right, so next is uh, activity number three. We've got another scenario here, Cindy. Okay, it's 12 p.m. The fire department issued an evacuation warning. Just to give you a little more information, the definition of an evacuation warning is get ready to leave. The uh, plan to have about an hour. Um, an evacuation order means leave now, but a warning means you've got about an hour. Plan on an yeah, hour could, lead it time. It could be longer than an hour. I mean, the more lead time they give you would be great, but don't assume that you have more than an hour. No. All right. All right, so the government folks, this might have started happening in advance of this moment. Um, PIOs crafting and reviewing messages and working with fire to get the right information. Management is informing elected officials, drafting an emergency proclamation, just because like Amanda said, it's like it needs to all be automatic. You can't, you can't be thinking about what to do because not unlike COVID, where we had a lot of time to figure it out, this is, this is minutes now we're talking. Um, Operations Mass Care is identifying a temporary evacuation point or TEP, which we're gonna talk more about next week, and evacuation sites or shelters, preparing signage, contacting volunteers to assist, reviewing shelter plans and checklists, talking to the Red Cross, Ops fire, sharing information with the public information officer in the planning and intelligence section is uh, anticipating requests for mutual aid building inspectors because that's what happens next if a fire goes down, collecting damage information, creating maps, anticipating action planning and, and action plan distribution. Logistics is getting ready to get the needed supplies. Finance is reviewing, I hope, the public assistance program and policy guide, which is all about disaster recovery and reimbursement. So um, anything else government that you would be doing and would you be doing it at a warning or are, are you waiting for an evacuation? I hope not. Anybody think of anything else that would be happening at this point? in the emergency operations center. And off all those terms, if, you, if you're not familiar with these terms, these are the incident command system terms that are used nationally. And we're actually doing a class on the incident command system next week on the 7th. So if you're not familiar, it's a, it's a good overview to get to start to learn these terms and be able to kind of speak that ICS language. All right. Hey, Cindy, this is Kia again. Um, I just um, 
I want to, uh, actually, let me email you. Let me email you. This is Marcia, that will work. All right, so while the, the Emergency Operations Center is doing that, what is everyone else doing? And I picked on assisted living, but any organization that might um, feel like they have people that would need to be get ready to be evacuated, do you have a plan to evacuate your facility? And these are just general questions. You can talk about whatever you want. Do you notify the family to come and pick up residents? Or do you have buses on call? Do you call 911 and say help? Do you have an agreement with a similar facility that can come and help you move them? Um, are there volunteers that you can call to come and help move? Maybe they're family volunteers, but uh, just I want to hear from the, the rest of the world what, um, what's going through your heads and what do you have to do when, when a warning comes out? Or are you not sure? Raise your hand if you want to talk. Okay. How about a college? Mm -hmm. Molly has her hand up. Oh, yay. And before you switch to Molly, Marcia, just a quick question. You might want to um, unshare and share again. Your slides are really fuzzy for some reason. Oh, okay. Let's... Yeah. And let's have Molly go ahead and speak. If you want to unmute. Hi, my name is Molly, and I'm uh, currently a volunteer with the Partnership for Inclusive Disaster Preparedness, the only US disability-led organization um, related to, dis to um, disasters. And so I'm calling, um, part of the team that's calling people who are affected by Hurricane um, Ida. And there is a, a national disability phone number. Um, and so things that have come up, for example, um, a couple that has, uh, he's a quadriplegic and um, she uses a um, walker um, and they had a uh, vehicle that had a, a lift for the wheelchair, um, but it was broken. And then they made arrangements to um, uh, rent a uh, van that also had a lift. Um, but uh, FEMA ended up uh, taking the entire um, uh, the entire small fleet of vehicles, and so it was by um, relationships. Um, uh, an accessible taxi driver from uh, Houston ended up getting down, and they arrived um, in a hotel ten minutes before Hurricane Ida hit. My message is that the same issues that um, arose in 20, 2005 with regards to um, uh, emergency plans and inclusiveness um, of, of messaging and getting out are still issues 16 years later. Um, and so a lot of the, the, the conversations um, that happen, um, I would say in addition to the pick one thing to get prepared for emergency, my challenge to each of you is pick one accessibility technique so make sure that your social media actually um, has alt text, um, that the videos are captioned, that you're practicing these daily skills um, and, and finding out resources to, to do so because an emergency isn't the time to find out and uh, we should be further along um, than we are. And so the people who are most often left behind and left for dead um, are people with disabilities and other access and functional needs, but there are also some of the folks that have the best insights on um, barriers and how to overcome them because day-to-day -day life means being extremely resourceful and connected and having mutual aid. So thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Molly. And I see you, Jan Molly. has her hand up too. So I do, because I have, uh, I work at Gavilan College, but I have another hat as well. I, uh, I work with Pit Stop Outreach and I chair the South County Homeless Task Force. And what I'd be doing early in this emergency is moving into an advocacy role and calling city managers, calling the police department and saying, hey, do not forget our unhoused population. Um, 
because people will not remember them or that they are human beings in need of services and evacuation assistance and that we're going to have to send human beings out there to talk to them uh, because they won't be connected on email and phone and and everything else um so you know that's the point and i think uh, you know to, to what molly said you know to be um it's a time for advocacy and reaching out to partners to remind the, everybody of the special need populations and uh, and what their needs are going to be. Yeah, and it's, it's a huge challenge and most of our planning has been for the population that is easy, mm -hmm. but more than half of the population is not easy. Right. If you really look at how many, you know, all of the different disabilities or the different languages, it's like mm -hmm. we do have a lot more that we need to do. And this is parting, part of trying to start that conversation and then break off into smaller focus areas. And this is a huge one. And it actually has to do with our very next slide. So mm -hmm. the current Current public education materials for wildfire across the county, I'm sure it's bigger than that, are that if you need extra time to evacuate for whatever reason, you have a big family, you got a bunch of pets, you need to leave when the warning is issued. So when that warning message is sent out by the jurisdiction, you already have to have in place your temporary evacuation point and a phone number where people can call that don't have transportation. And this might not be that they always don't have transportation. They may not have transportation today because they don't drive and their spouse is, out, is doing errands in another city or that they need medical transport because, you know, they have someone that is that lives in their bed <laughs> and they can't get into a wheelchair and they usually call and order medical transport. If everybody orders medical transport at the same time, there aren't gonna be enough. And usually that requires a, at least a 24 hour reservation. And then just accessible transportation like BTA for wheelchairs. So um, this was a realization for me a while back when I was doing some emergency preparedness planning. It's like, you have to know where your temporary evacuation points are. And we will talk a lot about the criteria for them and who runs them in the, in the session next week. Um, but does anybody want to comment on this? Um, the phone number, you know, it's one thing to have a phone number for people to call and say, I need help but where are we gonna get the resources? Um, what, I, what I wonder is how, do, how could this list be populated ahead of time? Like in, when there's no disaster, how can people sign up for, in case of emergency, I'm gonna need extra help. So we have at least part of a list ready to go. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Anna. Jay, Jay at 211 had a comment on what they're able to assist with. Hi, this is Jay. Good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, during uh, the last PSPS, um, I'm sorry, it wasn't even the PSPS, it was the fires. Um, we did have a few residents call 211. They didn't have transportation. And so we do have a partnership with Lyft and we were able to um, dispatch free rides to those residents. And so we still um, have a partnership with Lyft and we are able to dispatch free rides only during um, a time of like, PSPS or if there's a wildfire or any type of disaster where folks need to get out immediately. So we do have the ability to dispatch lift rides. Okay, this is Marcia, thank you. Um, this is one of those things that I feel like it would, it could have its own tabletop because when evacuation is called, there isn't a whole lot of time to send people into the area. And maybe, maybe this is all about having people know their neighbors and having a plan with their neighbors on how to get folks out. Because if we are relying on someone coming in, I don't know, I, that's not guaranteed. Hey Marsha, this is Kia. Yes. I have a question. Um, within the cadre uh, organization, um, 
do you currently have a list of, uh, you know, like transportation, uh, you know, I guess, uh, allied transportation resources uh, that you call? Or how does that work within Cadre? Like, uh, say we've exhausted all of our county resources, then we turn to Cadre. Do you have a list like this available? This is Marcia. No, we don't. We, well, and Cadre is not a service provider, but we can, we have actually on our website right now for COVID, there is a transportation list that's related to uh, free rides for people to go get tested or to go get their, their vaccination. Um, and then there's a lot of private sector, but we haven't had any conversations with them. I think this is another good place for us to work together to start to identify everyone, everyone yeah. that has accessible transportation because we may need them. I see Anna raising her hand. Yeah, William Nolan's asking, can we um, verbalize this question? He's wondering, is there an evacuation warning consideration for the hearing impaired population? Can one of our local emergency managers answer this one for us, please? How do you guys uh, notify uh, evacuation warnings for the hearing impaired population? I, I actually might. <clears throat> I mean, they send out a text. And I believe that most hearing impaired, I hope, have, a, they're, they use their phone a lot for text. Kia, yeah, can you answer that question? Yeah, that was directed at you. There you go. Oh, hi. Um, for, you know, that I don't have the information. I know that Daryl is on as well. Uh, maybe he can speak to that. But um, again, you know, we really, uh, if there was a evacuation warning um, or an emergency of some sort, it would be through the alert SEC system. And then I know that our sheriff's office, they do go door to door if uh, you know, uh, certain oh, households are identified as alert. SEC has the capability to send yeah. voice message. Do uh -huh. they do voice message and text? No. Nope. Okay, but that re that <laughs> requires that, that the hearing impaired resident or community member is signed up with alert SEC, correct? No. Uh, yeah. so, so, do we have any push out? Um, do you like the WIA push outs go out? I know we're a little ahead of ourselves, but do those go out as text messages as well? Yeah. Yes, yeah. they do. And then, you know, and then um, just to finish my thought, I know that the sheriff's office, they do go around, uh, you know, with do uh, doing the door knocks. Um, if we have identified, uh, you know, individuals who do have access and functional needs or, um, you know, any other individuals that haven't been able uh, or haven't responded to the alert SEC, uh, you know, notification. So we do do that as well. Okay, there's a lot of really good comments in the chat um, and I'm hoping people are able to see that. And if you aren't, let me know and I will um, message you the chat immediately. Um, Marsha, I think Molly had her hand up. Yes. Um, and um, I think we might want to verbalize a few things that are in the chat, but let's maybe let Molly speak. Yeah, Molly, go ahead. Hello, this is Molly. Um, so every organization, Cadre and all others, should be establishing um, relationships with local deaf serving organizations, including DACARA, the Deaf Counseling and Advocacy Referral Center. Um, they are actually having a workshop for Bay Area's deaf senior citizens, um, is the language that they use, I'd say deaf residents. Um, and that's going to be on uh, August 31st. One of the um, former uh, Dakara staff has just formed a, uh, is one of three that have got a new agency that's providing consulting. Um, so the bottom line is, um, you know, with Hurricane Ida, there are deaf led organizations that are putting video logs in, translating the information um, or interpreting the information that's in written uh, text. So having things in writing is, is really important, but also not all uh, people who are deaf um, are reading English or reading um, whatever their first language is. And so you can't just say a deaf person who is culturally deaf and uses sign language, American or otherwise, 
would be able to just, you can communicate by hand. So the things that we need to do now are building the relationships and being aware. So the way that I do that is I follow uh, deaf social media. And so then I'm familiar with what are the ways that it's pushed out. Same thing with um, uh, blind, Lighthouse for the Blind. So on the, on the short resources, and then keep in mind that um, this having equal opportunity is a requirement for every organization that receives federal funding. And the Americans Disabilities Act is 31 years ago. So there are really easy resources and the time is now to build those um, skills and relationships with organizations because um, the big earthquake is coming and the fires are now. And it was um, Liz, I uh, want a shout out for Liz at the Red Cross. Um, they hired an access and functional needs person, Sheridan Lane who was the first uh, deaf inter um, interpreter providing ASL and wildfires in California. So we've got some outstanding local resources. We just need to get that information out. Thank you. Yeah, I knew we, had, this is Marsha, I knew we had the technical expertise here. We just need to bring everybody together and, and then provide the education. That's very true. We need yeah. to put it together. Okay, Marisol, did you have something to say? Yes, I just want to add that Alert SCC does send out text messages um, out. And of course, if you, you're enrolled, it does include text messages and the and WIA messages as well. So I just wanted to add to what Kia had mentioned earlier. Um, that's how we send send out disseminate messages to the deaf and hard of hearing population. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go on. This, we've got another video here. Um, this is uh, Dr. Dennis Maletti. This is another FEMA prep talk. He has been studying uh, alert and warnings and how human beings respond to them for 45 years. And this clip is from a prep talk he did in February of 2018. Sadly, he died of COVID on January 31st of this year at 75 years old and we've lost a brilliant mind uh, but if any time that you can watch anything or read anything that he's published i highly recommend it this is very strange again this is not the way it was rehearsed. Hold on. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. There's a matrix I don't expect you to see. Just trust me that some of us in the country have gone through every warning dissemination mechanism we have at our disposal and have judged it in terms of the percentage of at-risk audience it can reach, whether it's a quick dissemination or a slow dissemination. For example, wireless emergency alerts are very quick. Root net notification where cops drive up and down the street with the blue lights doing this with a bull speaker is slow notification, very effective, but slow, uh, et cetera. At any rate, that potpourri exists in different levels in different cities and counties in our country. And selecting a good mix of both old fashioned technologies and wise technologies is probably very good. Uh, we're just beginning to collect data. In fact, I own it. I just finished a survey with a colleague, John Sorensen, of evacuation at the Oroville Dam in February of, this, of 2017. And we measured these things up one side and down the other. And I can tell you in that one event, what was the most effective dissemination technology, how long each different technology took to reach different segments of the audience, what percentage of the population evacuated, what percentage didn't. Uh, I haven't shared the data with the core yet, so I'll just give you a tidbit of a sneak preview. Wireless and modern emergency warning technology is fast. Mama is faster. What that means is the quickest way people got their first alert was because their mother 
or a friend or a relative got in touch with them. If there were one thing I wish I could tattoo inside your foreheads, it's this. Multiple dissemination channels for public disaster warnings yield quicker and more comprehensive audience penetration. There never has been, there never will be, a silver bullet for distributing warnings. One technology is insufficient because you need multiple technologies to reach different subpopulations in an at-risk audience. So I'd recommend doing two or three modern technologies and two or three old-fashioned technologies. Uh, we as SMS tested methods like radio, root notifications, special ways to reach unique subpopulations, and if you're into wireless emergency alerts, particularly iPause's WIA system, and I'm a Y-Pause and WIA system zealot, I know that's the warning system of the future in this country. I'm 100% behind it, and I want to make it as good as it possibly can be. It has to be one flower in a bouquet of dissemination channels that are used. And it has its advantages as well as disadvantages. And five, issue messages that reduced public action delay. Now, here's the social psychology part. I'm grinning because now I'm feeling like I'm back at the University of Colorado in a lecture hall. This is the problem you're up against when it comes to giving warnings. It's human beings. The myth is people immediately take protective actions when they receive a warning message. Here's my response to that. A social psychologist that studied this phenomenon for 45 years. If you believe that, you're nuts. <laughs> Let me say it in real simple language. When all the forest animals are running away from the flames, people who get the warning delay taking protective action and instead waste time searching the net, watching television, and talking with neighbors, trying to decide what, if anything, to do about the fire. It's called milling. It's fundamental to how human beings invent new realities in their minds. And go, a warning tells people they need to go from perceiving that they're safe to perceiving that they might die. That doesn't happen quickly. It, now, the prime objectives, therefore, in an American warning system of the future, the one I'm hoping to bring forth, is to minimize issuing alerts and warning messages in America that motivate milling and delay. And instead, to maximize issuing alert and warning messages that reduce delay and are actionable, that is, motivate public protective action. Two things I need to say. The second is the slide. The first thing is the Department of Homeland Security funded a lot of social psychologists and sociologists and communication people to study warnings a few years ago. And there were many breakthroughs learned. And one of the things that was learned that that 90 character we a messages accomplish nothing. What people do is get that message and say, what the blank was that? However, a message that provides them with the information that they would go in search of can actually minimize delay and maximize an appropriate, more timely response. Hallelujah. We discovered what we need to put in a warning to communicate to the person at risk to motivate them to take a protective action. I think that's the essence of what a warning system should do. And uh, the FCC believed us. And they said, we're going to take the 90 character limit off WIA messages, and we're going to give you 360 characters for a WIA message, because that's the size of a screen. But what impacts protective action initiation behavior in Americans the most? It's the message contents. It's the message contents. It's the message contents. Any questions about what the most important factor is? It's the message contents. It's what the message says and how it says it. And there also are contextual factors like 
whether there are personalization visualizations. They're really hard to issue warnings for a flood on a sunny day, for example. And it's about message repetition. People need to get warnings many times because human beings, even me, have thick skulls. Any of you encounter anybody like that? You know what I'm talking about. So what does the message need to be? It needs to be specific. For example, if you are in between the river and First Street, move north of Main Street. That tells people who's at risk. If you don't tell them who's at risk and who isn't, people prefer believing they're not at risk. Never say evacuate if you're near the river. That'll mean different things to different people. Some will leave, some won't. Uh, you need to be clear. A wave of water 20 feet high moving faster than a person can run is clear to the person being warned. Not a 10,000 cubic foot per second flow moving at a 20 foot per second speed. People don't know what that means. Fluvial geomorphologists do. <laughs> Dam operators do. They love these words. It communicates not out of the public. Uh, here are the things that need to be in a warning message based on the new DHS research. Source hazard, location personalization, consequences, protective action, protective action time, how action reduce, uh, procedures, uh, re reduces consequences, and the expiration time. What is he nuts? He wants to cram all that in a warning? Yes, here's the warning. 349 characters will fit in the next generation We a message. Elm County Sheriff. The source needs to come first. People want to know who they're listening to. What do we do in the country now? We put the source last. The source has to come first. Elm County Sheriff, floodwaters are approaching Wood City and will hit two blocks on both sides of Elm Creek from Highway 1 to 10 to Maple Road. People outside will be washed downstream. The water will be above rooftops. Move two blocks plus from the creek now and be there no later than 6 p.m. to avoid the flood. This message expires at 11 p.m. May 15th, 2017. 349 characters inside of our 360 character we are long message. Granted, I picked a simple one. I There's a lot in that video clip and it's twice that long. So I hope you can watch it all. As I a, could listen to that forever. He's, he's amazing. But, I, you know, just some of the things that he said, I mean, the personalization, you know, it's very easy to visualize people being washed away. That would get my attention uh, versus there's going to be a flood or and saying that the water is going to be above the rooftops and saying you must be at that location by this time, which also tells them they can't wait, you know, don't, don't put it off and think that they're going to say to cancel it. You, you have to do it now. Um, so I love that he says this message will expire. Also, I've, I've never done that before. I always send a second follow up message, which is kind of a pain, honestly. Yeah, no, that is a good way to avoid that second message. But even when we're sending messages out via voice, and I've worked at a uh, West Valley College on their alert and warning system. When you send a voice message, depending on how long the voice message is and what he just said, it's probably a good 40 seconds. The longer the voice message is, the longer it takes to get the voice message out to your population. And we just had a little population, like 4, 13, 14,000 people. But if you check the times that it takes for the message to cycle all the way through, it can take sometimes for the voice part 20 minutes. And if you send, like he said, repetition, if you send another message out the same way, they may start to overlap each other. So you might have, obviously you're gonna have conflicting information if you send an update and they get the update before the original. And that's just kind of the, how telephones work. So a lot of challenges, I wanted the nonprofits to realize that this is kind of difficult for, um, for public information officers because the message contents is the most important thing. It takes some time to craft that. Do we have time? No. So what do we have to do? We have to pre-script messages, right? 
we have to put some thought into what it's going to look like and then just fill in the street names. So that's, uh, that's my take on that. Anybody else have a comment? I just love his video. I'm all excited. My heart's beating fast now. All right, so the next part. There's a matrix I don't expect oh, you to see. Oh, that, a couple of people asked, and I do, first time I saw this video, the same thing. It's like, wait, put that video back on the screen. Um, I've, I have this document and I will send it out to everybody. But definitely whatever methods that you use, you need to time them and decide how, how fast they are or how adequate they are. But they're, I, I love the idea of having multiple, multiple ways of pushing the method out. And every organization helps to push the message out and push it deeper into the community. So he mentioned wireless emergency alerts and this great new 360 character WIA. So when I started to research this, I found some information that was a little alarming. People who have um, phones that are four, less than 4G, which are you know phones that are a few years old, cannot receive 360 characters. They can only receive 90. And what did he say about 90 characters? It wasn't useful. So I, in doing a little bit of research, I found that Verizon has created a comprehensive list. I don't know why, but a comprehensive list, and we'll put the link in the chat for every phone and what um, it's either uh, for, it's 1.0 or 2.0 and 3.0. 2.0 and 3.0 can receive 360 character messages, but 1.0 can't. So for anyone that has an old phone, older phone, for people that are low income that are, you know, have gotten a cheaper phone, it may not have the capability. And so that, at least for the time being, puts a little bit of a damper on our use of the 360 characters. And then next, and this is our alert SCC system. So right now, this is our pretty much our silver bullet. Um, and you can see that only 70% of, uh, or 7% of the population has registered. And this, uh, I got this straight from um, the County Office of Emergency Management just a couple days ago. So everybody on this call, we need to start pushing people to register. Marsha, I just want to be clear. Did you say seven or seven zero? Seven. Okay, thank you. It's 135,000 people are registered and we've had this system for many years now. Um, I, although I think we switched to a new system a couple years ago and it might have had to start over, I don't remember. But this is a serious problem that in any of these jurisdictions, it's, you know, it's less, it's less than a tenth of their population or close to that. And some of them, you know, five, San Jose, you got 57,000. That's pretty darn good. But you have 1.2 million people. So if this is the only way that we're sending messages out, it's not enough, right? Right. So um, we need, we need, this is one of the tools in our toolkit. We need more people registered. So everyone, please help all of your clients your congregation, your volunteers, make sure that they, okay, maybe I didn't exaggerate. Oh, Arn, ha ha. Okay, so um, just wanted to call that out because this is, this is a we thing. We all have to do this. Okay, we're getting close to the end here, very close to the end, and I wish we could talk more, but two hours is as long as you could possibly sit. Um, we're gonna, I hope, send a poll out. Can you do it, Anna? It's like four questions. You just have to hit four buttons. Um, yep. On your It'll screen. be up on your screen. Is it there? Please tell me it's there. These are, this is just um, feedback on, on this event so that we can tweak if we need to what we're going to do next week. And then we're going to just have the final, I'm not, it's not going to be a breakout. I had planned to, but we're getting too close to the end. So let's just chat again. Um, I think I can change my screen and not mess you up, I hope.
Yeah. Okay, so this is all about this, this whole alert and warning thing. Um, and the questions are pretty similar for the nonprofits as well as the government. But um, how do you commu communicate emergency information to your client, students, congregation? We talked about that a little bit. I think you did in the breakouts maybe. But what are your challenges? How can we help you? Or how can this group with all of the experts here, how can we come together and help you with those challenges? And then considering the fact that not everyone can get can get the alert SCC message fully, I'm wondering if if we might use alert SCC, or if if there's a model where alert SCC was more like the air raid siren, where it says it it alerts and people get it on their phone and there's a link to go to some place that doesn't have a 360 character limit, where it can have multiple translations in one place. I'm just throwing that out there because right now I think we, we could do more. And then um, we, and we already did chat about this. What do we do for the homeless and for people that turn their phones off at night and for people with cognitive impairment and it may just be we're, required, we're relying on their neighbors again. People have to know their neighbors. Um, and then for government, I was um, just the last question is different. It's what have you done to reduce the barriers to your alert, getting your message out as quickly as possible? And I know Kia said it takes an hour or so to get the translations. For this, that's not going to work, but I'm guessing you probably have prescripted messages for just this generic get out type stuff. Yeah, we do. We do have uh, generic messages uh, in queue uh, uh, now. Okay. Um, if other jurisdictions need those, maybe you could share. And I know you have a county public information group, don't you? Or you're part of it? Yes, we do have a South Bay PIO group um, where I'll share messages uh, uh, to the jurisdictions as well. But if you need any messaging, uh, for sure, uh, shoot me an email and I'll put my contact information in the uh, chat as well. Great. I think it would be helpful to to just work together and maybe maybe look at prescripted messages that everybody has and see if they if they meet Dennis's, Dr. Maletti's approval. And if not, let's fix them now. Any, any other thoughts on this? How about the homeless? Any thoughts on um, reaching the homeless? Is there? Um, I, I do, you know, there are... Uh, Say your name, please. This is Jan uh, Chargin, Pit Stop Outreach. Um, there is a, you know, the Office of Supportive Housing for Santa Clara County, but the best way to reach the people in an emergency is with the um, street level um, outreach volunteers and, and outreach workers. And there are some social media groups, like on Facebook, there are Facebook groups of uh, loose networks of outreach workers. And that's, you know, that's the best way to, uh, to get that out. Plus a lot of unhoused people also are on social media and that's a good way to do word of mouth. You know, um, you know, for like in Gilroy, I've got a number of people on social media, you know, who are unhoused on social media or their cell phones and can send out texts and say, spread the word. Uh, Cause you don't know whose phone is gonna be on right. you know, or charged at any time, so. Um, so you need those informal networks of, you know, somebody on a bicycle who can go out to encampments. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have something else to say? Yeah, I do. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, speak to the nonprofits that are on this call today. Um, you guys are truly, you know, a important part of the emergency planning process and, we want to get in touch with you. Um, I put my text, I, I put my email into the chat. Uh, please reach out to us. Oftentimes we're finding that 
when we communicate with our community-based organizations, it's usually just a one-way communication and we want to have a two-way communication with you. So please reach out to me uh, if you need uh, anything and uh, you know we'll continue reaching out to you as well. Yeah, and I see um, Tony in the chat said that he would he would magnify the messages by pushing them out, out on next door. I think that's really good too. Um, there's some homeless outreach being developed. So we're gonna capture all this. There will be an after action report from this exercise and we will bring everybody together that has these resources to share because there's no way to keep track of who's doing what and all of this is great work. So we will we'll, um, get it all in one place so that we can start to keep things more coordinated. Marsha, I think Denise Gluen had her hand up. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just, um, I, I did one of my first in-person outreaches um, and it was with nuns uh, at one of our uh, retirement communities yesterday. And one of the things I've done and I found in, it, it kind of helps with the languaging and everything is make it super simple. What is the one action step you want them to take? Even though it doesn't encompass all of the activities that need to get done, um, I've limited it to try to do three and I do the alerts and I just, I talk about that at the very beginning now, instead of everything else, um, a go bag, especially people that have medications, eyeglasses, phone chargers, you know, with those really things that you need for that 24 hours. I think people feel overwhelmed, kind of along with Jennifer mentioning the do one thing and then making plans, you know, two ways out of, of everywhere. If you have access to functional needs, if you have animals, what are those plans? And I've just really, and I, I, you know, I repeat that all through my presentations now because, you know, to hear it multiple times, you know, I tell them you can glaze over after this, but just these, you know, three things, please consider uh, in your day, you know, and that's kind of what I've, I've done in my pivot. I've been doing this stuff for a lot of years. And I think uh, that, that that's the important thing and pictures, because uh, the that pictures do help the language barrier. So do the go bag with the pictures of the things inside. So even if the language isn't there, the pictures are. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Oh, Denise School in Los Altos Hills County Fire District. Sorry, I didn't do that in the beginning. Thank you, Denise. No, and th that's great information. This is all great information. There are questions in the chat that are not not answered yet, we will get you answers. Um, and we're almost done here. Last thing, this, this system, Zone Haven is not up and running yet, but it is, you can log into it. So you can see the website on this screenshot is, uh, you have to do the HTTPS colon slash slash community.zonehaven.com. And you can see that part of, part of the county has already been zoned out, zoned, designation it's the highest wildfire risk and it's also county fire part of county fires area and they paid to bring this into the county i believe so um, this will be a resource in the future to make it more clear when when your area is being asked to evacuate so stay tuned for more on that any other questions like you already all know the answers to the fire tunes, but I'll put it there because um, we're almost out of time. You're going to get a survey. I don't know if it's going to pop up at the when you sign off or if um, we're going to have to send it out to you, but it's asking you two questions. One is, do you want to be on a follow-up meeting related to any of these topics that we just talked about? And the second is, who wasn't here that we need to include? So please answer that survey for us. Um, our next meeting will be next week, same time, same place. We will um, publicize at that meeting who won the technical assistance and you've got to be present to win. So if you didn't sign up, I hope you can. And this was all the songs and I know a lot of you got them. So congratulations. Marsha, you said um, the next meeting is next week. So there's nothing this Thursday? No. Okay, thanks. No, it's this Wednesday. And then the third, the third presentation will be in October. I want to give you a little bit of time to breathe. And we need a little time to breathe in designing exercises. But um, 
there was just too information to cram into two as we started to get into it. And obviously, even today, these topics are big. They're global. They're everybody needs to be on the same page. And we really don't spend enough time just focused on getting the message out to the whole population. So I thank you for for all of your sharing today on that. And um, any last comments from anyone? Just a round of applause to all of you who stuck it through yeah. to the end. Marcia was busy. We um, at 10.59, we had 70 of our 80 participants with us throughout this That's program. So thank you all. Um,